Okay, looks like we're on. Hi. So, my name is Nikolai, and I don't want to bore you, so I'll start right away with JUnit 5. Quick question before that. Has anybody seen this talk before? Because if you have, now is a good time to leave. <laughs> um, it's going to be very similar to what you've seen before. Okay, other than that, who's used JUnit 4 ever? Wow. Last month? Last week? Today? Yeah, <laughs> cool, cool. I need your help, um, because when we start, I'm going to have to ask you some questions, and I need you to answer. Well, let's go over here so I see my slides. Um, yeah, Janet 5 is a work in progress. So that means that uh, there will be at least half a year more before any general availability uh, will be released. So if you want to provide feedback because you're missing some feature or um, you have a good idea, now is a good time to do that. And these are a couple of links. Uh, when you will see the uh, talk, the slides online soon, you can follow me at here, NipaFX on Twitter. I'll put them online uh, today or tomorrow. The interesting things you can also Google. There's a GitHub, GitHub repository, of course. Um, there's a great user guide, which you can uh, read at like, let's say, an hour or two, and you will know pretty much everything there is to know about JUnit. They're active on Twitter, and also I write articles on my blog. That being said, I'm not part of the team. I'm just interested in the project. Okay, so now let's start with the basics. And the basics will be um, how to write a JUnit 5 test. And what I will show you now is actually valid JUnit 5 tests, and they will look eerily similar to what you might know from JUnit 4. So similar, in fact, it might not always be easy to spot the difference. So I need you to do that. So this, for example, is a valid JUnit 5 test. What's new? And you have to scream so I can hear you. No public, exactly. See, it's just package visible. Oh yeah, somebody else said package, right. Um, what's new here? Static, no. So these are the lifecycle methods, right? It's different names, right, before each. They used to be called before and before class, now it's before each and before all, which I think is a nice addition, a nice change, sorry, to, um, because these names are uh, less technical. Okay, what's new here? Disabled, exactly. It used to be ignored, now it's disabled, but it does exactly the same thing, except that it takes a um, string that you can write in while you disabled it. I think ignored didn't do that. So that's new. What's new here? <laughs> Save it on Friday. So do you think it's in the public API? Eh, no, most, most likely not. But we can create that in a way that fits seamlessly into the whole thing. Um, and we'll see later how that works. What's new here? Exactly, the parameter order. This is a really small detail, but I like it so much because it always annoyed me that this was going to the beginning the message would go in the beginning and then, you know, sometimes you have one, sometimes you don't, and then the arguments that you really care about, they jump around like crazy. So I think that's a cool change. This one is so easy, even I can do it. Um, you can now create, lazily create the message. This can be an interesting optimization. If you have, a, in the failure case, you want to create a very expensive message, you usually would do that on every run, even though hopefully the test would rarely ever fail. Uh, now you can defer that and you just pay for the lambda there, which is basically for free, and you can evaluate the actual message uh, when you need it. What's new here? Assert, assert, assert. Assert all. Exactly, assert all. So I can hand it a couple of parameters, uh, sorry, a couple of lambdas, which do their own assertions, and it would execute all of them, and it will give me all the results. So before, if I would have just done this, without the lambdas, just these this assertions, then the first one would already fail because it's city and not C, and I would never see the other ones. This now is different. With assert all, you can do that, and it looks like this. Um, so you can see all the results, which comes in handy in many situations. What's new here? So it throws, exactly. Um, you just give it the type of exception you're accepting and the method you want to call, 
and it will fail if that exception is not thrown. And it also returns the exception. Not yet, in milestone 2 it doesn't. Uh, in milestone 3 it will. Um, and you can use that exception that is returned to make further assertions. You used to do this in JUnit 4 by writing expected up there. But that's gone, as well as timeout. Both can now be realized with assertions, which I think um, makes more sense because it is more precise, especially expected exception had the problem that you never knew where exactly the exception was coming from. If a different method would throw the exception you were expecting, then your test might pass for the wrong reasons. What's new here? Nested. What could it possibly do? Yeah, BDDs, exactly. Um, well, that's what it can be used for. So what it does in the first place is it just executes all the tests that are in here or in here as well. So you, there was a runner to do that in JNet4. Um, now you can do it out of the box. So you can organize your test spaces in inner classes, test cases, sorry, in inner classes, and you have the great advantage of being able to use lifecycle methods at each point here to gradually provide the state you want to. Let's look at something different. Display name. Well, that's kind of obvious, right? Some kind of display name. Um, let's see how they work together. This is a screenshot from the from IntelliJ, which is currently supporting JNet5. Um, ignoring this for a moment, the JNet Jupyter line there, you can read it pretty clearly. Testing a stack, a stack where new, after pushing an element, is no longer empty. And what happened here is that these, each of these new um, nodes in this kind of like in this tree is a new nested test class, and the display name was used to provide a nice display name. So if you're into BDD style programming and testing, this should be really great for you. What's new here? Somebody else? <laughs> yes, the parameter, exactly. Um, well, I call it my server to make perfectly clear this is a server that I implemented, a uh, class that I provided. So. How can the test have parameters? How would JUnit know which, which instances to provide? And we'll see that soon. So what have we seen so far in the, in the basics? We've seen that um, lifecycle methods work like before. Well, we haven't seen it. I promised you that's the case. They're just renamed. Many details were improved, like small things, like public, that we don't longer um, have to do, which were like kind of annoying or weren't perfect, like expected exceptions. Nested and display name make a really nice way to structure tests in a very readable way, especially on the tool output. Um, parameter injection. We um, haven't discussed how that works, but we saw that it, that it exists. And we haven't seen any lambdas so far, which is a little bit disappointing because, you know, JNet5 used to be called JNet Lambda in the beginning. So where are the lambdas? Since I'm disappointing you, um, in the 45-minute version of this talk, we we'll now go into dynamic tests and how we can use that to write tests with lambdas. Alas, it's just a 30-minute version, so we're not doing that. So that's all great, right? We're seeing a couple of new things, um, but the subtitle of the talk is Next Generation Testing, and this is more like, meh, nice improvement testing. So uh, we have to see how where, where this promise comes in. Let's look at the extension model. When you think about JNet4, um, how was it extended? There were two mechanisms. The first one was there since 4.0, which was runners. Um, a runner had the advantage that you could do everything with it. It had the disadvantage that you kind of had to do everything with it. You could extend some existing class, but you had to do a lot of coding to mainly only make a small change in what the test actually does. But the um, more limiting problem was that you could only have one runner at any time. So if you wanted to use the spring runner and the Mokita runner, and the parameterized runner, and the nested test classes runner, then you're out of luck. You can just use one of those. So in January 4.7, rules came to the game. So the idea was that you can use rules, you can use many of them, and you can apply them like this, uh, which I guess most of you have already seen, and they're much more lightweight, which means it's easier to implement them. But they're also limited in what they could do. Um, it's not entirely precise, but I think it's a good estimation to say you could mainly do before-after kind of things, like before a test was executed and after, or before um, a lifecycle method was executed, executed and after. Um, but you could not model all you wanted to do with that, which meant that they now have two extension models, and neither of them is all encompassing. You have to choose which one you want to use as an implementer. 
um, as someone who implements an extension. Both come with serious drawbacks, and compositions among rules were not always perfect. So while the extension model in Genie 4 is generally good, I mean, Genie 4 has been around for a long time, there is room for improvement. And in Genie 5, a different approach was taken. The idea was um, to have extension points over features, which means let's not implement all the features that we want to have as a core feature, but maybe de design the extension points to such a degree that we can implement some of our own features over via these extension points. And this is exactly what they did. So quite literally, Genie 5 has a concept called extension points, and this is them. And there will be a test afterwards, so you have like three seconds more to memorize them. Three, two, one, go. Awesome. Um, so it's not that important which exactly they were. Um, there's an extent, well, we'll take them again. So we can see some kinds, you might, some things you might know, like before each, you know, there's a before each method, so a callback might make sense. Parameter resolution. We saw that you can somehow provide parameters, so an extension point there makes sense. But what exactly is an extension point? That's pretty easy. It's an interface. For each extension point, you have one interface, and usually they only have one, maybe two methods. So really focused on one specific thing to do that well. And then you have to, when you implement the extension, you have to you know, provide, you have to assess the context in which the test is run. And you can do that because Janet 5 will collect everything, well, everything that you might need and put it into this kind of test context, which you see here, and then it calls your method with that. So when you implement, for example, the before each callback, you just have to implement this one interface and you just have to implement this one method and Janet 5 will be gathering all information, put it into a context and call your method with that. And if your extension is not totally trivial, it might want to do I might want to interact with uh, several extension points, so you just implement several interfaces. Let's have a small, um, small example. Let's say we want to benchmark our test. So for each test method, we want to write the test that elapsed to the console. How exactly do we want to do that? Well, what I wrote down, down there is pretty technical already. It's extremely close to the implementation. Before a test execution, we want to store the elapsed, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, store the launch time. And afterwards, we just print the elapsed time. That's kind of trivial, right? And it is. Um, when we look at the benchmark, benchmark extension, it's really simple. We implement these two interfaces before test execution and after test execution. We use a field to store the launch time, which, by the way, we shouldn't. There's a mechanism for that. We're not going to cover that here, but I will show you a link later where you can look this up. Um, and then we just implement the two methods. And before test execution is extremely simple, you just write the current time millis to the launch time field. And then after test execution, you have to do something which at least resembles logic. You have to actually subtract the launch time to compute the, the elapsed time. And then you print the message. And because it's fun, we use something from the context, in this case, the display name. So if the test that was run was called my foobar test, then the output would be test my foobar test took, I don't know, 100 milliseconds. So this is how you can access the context if you want to. Okay, so you remember this, right? And I already kind of gave it away that this is not really in the API, so let's see how it works. To implement something that disables tests, there are two extension points. One for the whole container, meaning the whole test class and all the nested classes, and one for individual tests. We'll look at the second. So the test execution condition is the interface I have to implement, evaluate is the method I have to implement, and returns a condition evaluation result, which I had to cut short to make it fit on the slide. Also, again, we get the text extension context, as before, but we don't really need it here. Um, this implementation, implementation is also pretty simple. We just check whether it's Friday and however that is implemented. And then we use the um, static factory methods on condition evaluation result, either disabled or enabled. And you know, if we return disabled, you can see where this is going. Janet 5 calls this method, sees that the return result says I'm disabled, and then it will just not run the test. And if we do this on a container, which is very similar, um, we would accordingly not run any test in the whole container. Okay, last example. We talked about parameter injection. How does that work? Again, there's an extension point, parameter resolver. This is, I think, the most complicated one because it has all of two methods. So the first one is supports. Whenever JUnit encounters a parameter in a test method, 
it asks the extensions like, do you support this parameter type? Or in general, do you support this parameter, not only the type, do you support this parameter? In this case, our extension is aimed at the my server type. So we just check, we get from the parameter context the parameter and check its type and see whether it's a my server class. Maybe we should do some thing which works better with subtyping, but you know whether you get my meaning. So in this case, if it's a my server, we say yes, we support it. And then later, JNet will ask us to resolve this instance and give it actually an instance of my server. The interesting thing here is that this parameter context contains a lot of other information. For example, you can use it to access annotations, either on the parameter itself or on the test method. Um, in this case, we didn't need this because we say we create all the my server parameters. But imagine for a moment how a, um, a Mokito extension would work. Mokito is able to basically mock every kind of type. But it shouldn't mock my server because maybe I want to do that. So it, if I have the Mokito extension in play and it would just say, look, I support everything, I just return true here, then it would always be Mokito providing an instance, uh, which I don't want. So the uh, very basic Mokito extension would just do uh, something, something different. It would require the user to add an add mock annotation to each parameter. And then here it would check, is the parameter I'm supposed to support, is it annotated with add mock? And if it is, I say yes. And if it's not, I say I don't support it. Okay, and so far we only talked about how we write extensions. Now we also have to make JUnit aware of the existence of this extension, so we can actually call them. And this is the mechanism, the basic mechanism to do that. You just extend with, write down your class, and you're done. I think Spring does something similar. But that's not, kind of, that's not nice, right? It's very technical and it's not, it's not a good way to, trans to, to uh, transport the information. So what can we do? We can use meta annotations. This is my personal experiment of looking how often I can put annotation on the same slide, like one, two, three, four, five, I think. Um, uh, if you don't know about meta annotations, in, Jan uh, sorry, in Java you cannot inherit from another annotation. So if you want to say my annotation is like that one over there, you cannot inherit from it, which would maybe do with types. What you can do is you can apply that annotation on yourself if it's written in a way that, that works. So you're meta annotating yourself. Uh, and if you've ever written an, an annotation, you know that, for example, you have to uh, provide the retention policy. Well, is also a meta, meta, meta annotation, because retention policy can only be applied to other annotations. So applying annotations to other annotations is nothing, nothing new. The interesting part is that JNet 5 supports this mechanism by checking meta annotations. So whenever JNet 5 looks for a specific annotation, let's say it looks for the attest annotation, it doesn't simply look at the method and say, is this annotated with attest? No. It looks at the method, looks at all the annotations it has, and looks at all of their annotations and their annotations and so forth, till it exhausted the whole tree, basically. Um, well, it's, a, it's not a tree, it's a forest, but anyway, till it explored all the possible annotations that are on there directly or meta annotated and evaluate that set, which is really cool because that allows us to create our own annotations that fit seamlessly into JNet 5. And this is how we do it. The first thing up there was our disabled on Friday annotation. We just created, and maybe we need some other meta annotations here, but the only one that is important for us right now is this extended extend with. So whenever JNet 5 sees the disabled on Friday annotation, it goes looking for more annotations on there. It finds the extend with annotation, applies the extension, and then calls the extension at all the interesting parts in the lifecycle. So, we can use it for other kind of stuff. Let's say, for example, um, you're running a lot of integration tests, which you know, many, many, many projects do, so it makes, maybe it makes sense to identify them in a different way. In this particular way, instance, we can tag them, a feature we're not going to explore, but it largely means that you can tell JNet to just run things that are tagged or not tagged with that particular tag. So, for example, you could have one run which t runs all tests which are not integration tests, not tagged with integration, another run which runs only the tags, only the ones tagged with integration. Uh, we add a test to that integration test, and we extend it with our benchmark extension because, you know, ten, um, um, integration tests are slow, so we want to benchmark them, and because we want to maybe use the MyServer parameter a lot, we put on that implement that uh, annotation as well, sorry, that extension as well. And now we can do all of this. It's really cool. Now we can just write a normal test, test login, for example, and we just provide it with the add integration test annotation. 
Jane will recognize that it's a test, recognize that it's tagged, it will apply our extension, and it will largely just work. Uh, not largely, it will just work, which is really a nice way to write um, our own extensions in a way that you can't really tell the difference. They don't stick out like a sore thumb. A sore thumb. Also this one, maybe, because integration tests. Okay, so um, summarizing extensions. We've seen that um, you have a lot of flexibility because of many extension points, and they compose well. Um, they are pretty good, well customizable due to meta annotations, but we left out some small details which you can find behind the link. Again, how is this next generation testing? It's just a nice way to use JUnit 5. So let's go further and look at the architecture. When you look at the jar level of JUnit 4, then you could say there is not even an architecture. It's just JUnit 4 with Hamcrest hanging on at the side. And this artifact is used by everyone. You want to write a test, as a developer, you use that one. You want to write an extension, you use the same artifact. You're an IDE or build tool, you want to provide JUnit features, same artifact. There's no separation of concerns, and this is not just something to whine about, it's actually had a lot of um, negative impact on the project. Because our tools provide us with a lot of awesome features, but the JNet API was not always powerful enough to provide them. So what do you do if there's some, you know the information is in there, but there's no API to get to them. I use reflection. And this was used to an extent that even individual fields in, in, in special classes were reflected over, so even renaming that one field would break tools. You can see as a maintainer of such a project, that is not the nicest way to program, and you can never make any refactorings of internal stuff because somebody might be depending on it. Since the tools are an important part of JNet's success, you might also not just want to say, well, bad luck for you guys, just find another way. So nothing was really safe. Tools were bound to implementation details and maintenance and evolution were made harder than they should have been. And this kind of maneuvered JNet4 into a dead end. Johannes Link, which was um, one of the initiators of JNet5 rewrite, said that the success of JNet as a platform prevents the development of JNet as a tool. The tool that we write tests against could not be developed well enough um, because the platform, the JNet as a platform, was so ubiquitous that everybody integrated on it in a way that prevented further development. So JNet5 took a different approach. From the beginning on, the idea was that we need to separate these concerns. We want to have an API to write tests against, we want to have a mechanism to, write and to discover and run tests, and we want to have an API for tools to run these tests. When you look at this, you might wonder which API and which mechanism exactly, because I mean the tools should always use the same API, but I mean JNet5 has one API and JNet4 has a different one. Could, is there some potential there? And indeed there is. Um, the mechanism to discover and run tests is further split apart. You have a specific engine for each variant of tests. So you have an engine that runs JNet5 tests, an engine that runs JNet4 tests. You have an API for that, and then you have something that orchestrates different engines. So when I've been saying JNet5, well, I've not been lying, but I've been imprecise. That's just an umbrella for three different subprojects. We so far only talked about JNet Jupyter, which is the new API, and which has an engine that runs these tests. As a test author, you will never see these engines. Then there's JNet Vintage, which does the same for JNet4 tests. Um, so the JNet4 artifact can be used to write tests against, and the JNet Vintage engine can then run these. And then you have the platform, which is new. This has never been in JNet before, this concept. You have the platform engine, which is the interface that these engines implement. You have a couple of other ones, but you mainly have the platform runner, which is the API that tools use to run tests. So this is how that looks. You would write your tests up there against the JNU Jupyter API. Down here are the tools. They communicate with the JNU platform runner, so that, for example, that will run all the tests in this package. Then the runner goes to the engine implementations and tells its engine implementations to run all the tests in that package. And then each engine looks into this package and looks for tests that it understands. JNet5 run JNet5 tests, for example. So that means now there's a clear separation of concerns, an API for developers and API for tools. And that's kind of nice, right? But we're coming close to the end, so where's the next generation, I promised? And I think this is it. This is the important part, because this opens up the platform. This means that whatever you want, 
whenever you have a new kind of testing thing that you want to try out, that you want to implement, all you need is an engine. For example, you want to run JUnit 4 tests within that architecture, create an engine, or don't, because it already exists. Um, test NG, you want to have the same exact support as JUnit, write an engine. Or whatever you can think of. Whatever you can come up with, write an engine, and it runs within the JUnit 5 platform and gets a lot, a lot of the tool support that JUnit has. So this would what this would be, look, would, would be looking like. So just to make clear, the test NG part is totally made up, just as an example. Um, but you can see here how they integrate. These different engines all implement the same interface. They register themselves at the, at the service loader, and the runner will find all of these and then call them. So let's, let's look into the future. Let's say all tools that we know, all the build tools, all the IDEs, they have native JNet5 support. Now the tools are decoupled from the implementation details, and they can support all frameworks almost equally, wo equally well. There might be some details where uh, it's still not possible, but largely they can support, fully support all of these tools. So whenever you want to create a new framework or use a new framework, you have much higher chance of getting good tool support because before, if you write a new framework, you have to either convince people to use it without tool support, which is hard, or write plugins for all the tools, which is hard, or convince the tools, tool, tool maintainers to integrate your um, framework, which is unlikely because nobody uses it. So now you have, as a developer of a framework and a user of a framework, much higher chance to start with a good support of the box. And I think this might lead to a new generation of testing frameworks. And the success that JNet had as a plat platform becomes available to everybody. And I think this could herald a next generation of testing on the JVM. This could mean that we see much more creativity when it comes to writing testing frameworks and trying out testing frameworks. Because it's much easier to convince your tech lead or um, somebody else in your company to use a tool that at least has a uh, framework that at least has good tool support. So summarizing the architecture, we have a clear separation of concerns, API for developers tools, and also new frameworks to implement. And the platform opens up and can, you can have tool support for everybody. And there's a little bit more to the story, which we're going to cut here. I said we, have to, we look into the future and imagine JNet 5 support is already there. We're not quite there yet, so let's spend the last two minutes looking at where we are actually when it comes to tool support right now. This is, of course, a moving target, so this might change quickly. If you want to write tests, it's really easy. You just pick up this artifact and you start writing tests. Now, if you're concerned that some of them might fail at some point, you might want to run them as well. And then you're kind of out of luck unless you're using IntelliJ, which has good support. It's not perfect, but it works fine. Um, the other tools, not that much. I didn't find an issue on the Gradle issue tracker, NetBeans issue tracker. All that information is like a month old. Maybe I should check again. And Maven and Eclipse, there are issues there in both issue trackers, and there is progress being made. It's just not there yet. So assume you, wanna, you have written some JNet5 tests and you want to try them out right now. How do you do that, apart from using IntelliJ? You have a couple other choices, actually. I said earlier how you can run JNet4 within JNet5. You can also get, go the other way around. You can have a JNet5 test annotated with this JNet4 runner, and that runner understands JNet5 and runs JNet5 tests. And you can also do this for a whole package and all sub-packages, which is a really nice way to do that. You can just say, look, um, in this package are all my Gen 5 tests. You put this class somewhere in your code. Gen 4 will pick it up. The Gen platform runner will be in charge of looking into these packages and running all the Gen 5 tests. That works quite nicely. If you want to run them with the build tools, there is a Gradle plugin and a Maven Surefire provider, but these were implemented as proof of concepts by the Gen 5 team. These are not adopted yet by the maintainers of the build tools, but Actually, Maven is now, the Maven um, Shofar provider is now being moved um, into the Maven, um, Maven project. So this might change soon. And if all that is too fancy, you just want to do the console, there you go. There's, a, um, there's an artifact for that. You download it. You have to fiddle, fiddle around a little bit with the dependencies and with the um, jars you have to put in there. But then you can do this. You just say, look, these are the path to all my compiled test classes, run them all, or run a specific one. And the cool thing about this is it already understands JNet5 pretty well, because it was written for JNet5, so you get nice, colorful out output with a lot of more information. Um, this is actually the most advanced integration, because 
it's just printing to the console. Um, everything else is still losing a couple of information, for example, let's say test names or something. Okay, so tool and setup, you can start writing tests right away. Only IntelliJ has native support. I think running, if you're using a different tool, running them within Genuit 4 is a good compromise. Time's up. Good, because one last slide. So we've seen a um, new API with some incremental changes, the Jupyter API, which changes some details, a lot of details actually, which I think is good. Um, we have looked at the extension model, which I think is promising and going the right way. Still not perfect yet, but there are a lot of issues open and they will be addressed, I'm sure. How the architecture opens up the platform, and while tool support is not there yet, it might be, and this might be a stronghold for JNet5, good tool support for all the other frameworks as well. So, before I didn't bore you in the beginning, I want to bore you now. Uh, I'm Nikolai, you can find me on Google Plus if you want, or on Twitter, or this is where I write articles. And if you want to read more about Java, I'm an editor for SidePoint's Java channel, we recently opened up, and there's interesting stuff there in the past, particularly about JNet5 and Java 9. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much.